th there's, these problems can, are solvable, you know. Um, I'm not saying the max is solvable. I, I, I would probably not build that plane anymore if it was up to me. The people that we talk to are telling us that the, unfortunately the factory is in, which is shocking for me to believe, um, it's in worse, case, worse shape than it was, you know, before the planes were built to crash. Yeah, I worked for the company for 10 years and had different positions in the company. I started in a program management responsibilities with a kind of software development for uh, the 787 program. And then I moved to flight tests and operations. So I worked with the flight test crews, you know, helping schedule flights and, and, and doing all that. And then I moved to the factory and I worked in the factory as a senior manager in the uh, 737 factory over in Renton. Uh, not at all. Um, in fact, we we're just thankful that it wasn't, you know, a fatality. We've been monitoring. When I say we, there's a group of us that have been working together um, for several years now, just closely monitoring the Max. You know, we were actually monitoring the Max before it went back into service, and we've been very concerned by what we've been seeing in some of the data and some of the reports, um, issues involving production quality engineering exemptions that are being requested. So we, we've been very um, dialed in and, and concerned, and we've been trying our best to get the word out to people. We've been working with Congress, um, working with the FAA, you know, working with anybody that would talk to us, because the public message is everything's fine, the plane's out there, there's billions of dollars being sold, you know, billions of dollars worth of airplanes being sold. And, and obviously, I just want to say up front, because I, sometimes I forget to say this, but I want to say it, is that I am a big fan of the Boeing company. And that my family has worked at the Boeing company. I have friends that work at the Boeing company, and I want the company to be successful. And unfortunately, when you see these kinds of things that are happening, and then you know, putting passengers at risk, and flight crews at risk, um, you know, feel obligated to speak up. So that's what we've been trying to do as a team. We have a foundation that we're trying to um, really raise attention on matters. So I guess it's a long answer, Gwen, but not at all. We weren't surprised at all. It, there's several root causes. Um, and a lot of this obviously goes back to the two max crashes. And I'd say first and foremost, it's leadership or lack of leadership. You know, the, the board of directors of the company have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that um, the airplanes and the products are safe. The CEO has a responsibility. You know, I, I saw in the news that he made, you know, a big deal about coming to Renton and visiting Renton and being at the site. That's a problem. I mean, when your CEO is, um, it's a big deal for the CEO to show up. I mean, he should be very familiar. He should be frequently at the site, walking around, talking to the employees, finding out what their issues are, sitting in a corporate office in Arlington, Virginia, and talking to people about the stock, that's not going to get the plane healthy, it's not going to get the company healthy. And unfortunately, the board of directors has also been, you know, completely out. I mean, they just, I don't know what they're doing. And so the people that we talk to are telling us that, the, unfortunately, the factory is in, which is shocking for me to believe, um, it's in worse, case, worse shape than it was, you know, before the planes were built to crash. So I know this isn't reassuring to, to passengers. I mean, it's certainly not, you know, confidence inspiring. But we have to admit these problems exist, meaning the company has to admit that all these issues are really real. It's not just a blowout of the door, right? That's a visible, obviously um, scary situation. But we've noticed a lot of uh, issues with the planes. I mean, we have had flight management computers f repeatedly failing. We've seen stab trim motor failures. I know some of this doesn't make, you know, may not make sense, but these are flight related safety systems. And these are new airplanes, you know, and if anybody wants to kind of judge for themselves, we have, um, the, the FAA has a very fancy database, but it's, it's really hard to, to 
figured out how to use it if you're even if you're an aviation person because the nomenclature and stuff <laughs> yeah but um but anyhow we we, we figure out a way to, to take their data and, and select reports and put it into a more user-friendly view so you know people can look at it under our incident reports tab and you can read for yourself and just go down and look at these incidents uh, we did a report in september um, we looked at an analysis of um, all these reports and it just so happened that alaska airlines which is actually the airline of my choice has been my f my favorite airline you know it's had a boatload i mean large numbers of reports and when you look at the hours and how many hours a plane is, you know, it's, it's, they're brand new planes. They should not be having those kinds of problems. And this information is, is not really available to the public. So the public is unaware of this. So it's, it's a very concerning situation. So I've flown 737s my whole life. I will not step on a, on a MAX. In fact, it actually happened to me. I was flying to New York, New Jersey, and I purposely scheduled myself away from flying a MAX. And I got on the plane last, and I realized it was a MAX, and I had to walk off the plane. You know, I walked off the plane and waited all night to do a, a mid, midnight, you know, red eye. Um, I just, I know that plane has got problems. It's not the type of quality that the company is known for. Um, you know, there's a famous story that I, I want to say, I haven't said it to anybody in a long time because I read it. Bill Boeing, you know, the founder, right. in the first factory, he walked, you know, the story goes that he was walking in the factory and he saw these parts that were um, wood parts back then, but they weren't cut to the precision that he, you know, that was ne necessary to right. build the plane. And he took the parts and he threw them on the ground and he stomped on them. He said, we don't build planes like that. See, that's the kind of, and we have the people, we have the skilled talent and the people, but you can't work them like dogs. You can't give them, you know, unrealistic schedules. Um, you take away quality control inspections, which is ridiculous, especially in light of two fatal crashes that killed 346 people. So there's, there's things that you just don't do, and we're doing, and, and, and that's why we're not building planes to the quality that we are, you know, have, we have done historically. Yeah. And it, it really is a leadership, complete, utter leadership failure right now. You know, the FAA has been absolutely asleep at the wheel. You know, they've had a revolving leadership there, unfortunately. And again, um, not to, you know, critique individual FAA employees, because there's great employees there I've worked with in the past myself. But the leadership has been a mess. And the accountability is bad. The, um, you know, we have, um, you have employees that are asked to do stuff that is not necessarily the, they're not necessarily the right person to do it. And so, for example, incident reporting, they're supposed to be investigating all these incidents, you know, and just in the last couple, just from memory, we had a United Max airplane that was at 37,000 feet and they had an engine failure and, a, you know, alerts and all that and the pilot shut it down, came back and landed. That plane was 40 hours old, you know. Uh, 40 hours old. We had a Southwest plane that took off at a Phoenix, another Max plane, not a, not a Dash 9, a Dash 8. As soon as they took off, they didn't have power to the back of the horizontal stabilizer. Its pilots couldn't, you know, use the automatic trim. To, they had to come back and land. That plane was delivered the night before by Boeing. I mean, this is not quality control. You know, Alaska plane going descending to 12,000 feet and had icing conditions and the wing anti-icing system wouldn't work. And if anybody wants to draw, you know, kind of you know, go back and look for yourself and decide. I urge you to go just check it out and look at that report site and, and just, you can scroll down and read them. And these things should not be happening to new, new airplanes. The older planes shouldn't be having these problems and brand new planes should absolutely not, and the flight crew shouldn't have to be dealing with this. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really concern. So no, it gets back to your original question. Am I surprised? No. Airlines are, are a huge part of the problem, right? They, they want new planes, understandably, they want to travel. There's a, a huge demand and there's money to be made. But Alaska Airlines has had issues with these planes. Um, I don't know the exact issues, the pressurization, supposedly there were some write-ups about that. But the air, we wrote to the, I wrote to the CEO of Alaska back in April. Uh, when I was on the uh, Flyers' Rights, I was a board member, and I, I, we were concerned about it, and we sent a, a, a direct letter. I sent a, I sent a direct letter to the CEO. Um, we've actually talked to Congress. We've talked to the FAA. Um, so 
the airline has a responsibility. You can't say that safety is your top priority and you go, you keep flying a plane that has problems. And this is something we've noticed in the data. So you'll have a malfunction that will occur and then supposedly it gets troubleshooted and they fix it. And then, but then it'll recur again a week later and then another time two weeks later. And so you're going, what is going on here? Why is this a chronically happening? So the airlines have to take a responsibility and they, they should be demanding. They should absolutely be saying, you know, Boeing, this is not right. You need to help us fix this. You know, this is really important. If I had to say, you just maybe think about this. Yeah. Alaska Airlines is the closest airline in the world geographically to the home of the 737 program. It's, you know, 20 minutes down 405. If that airline is having these kinds of problems, what is happening overseas? The, most of these airplanes, 800 plus of these planes are actually overseas. We have no visibility into those um, airlines and how, what's happening on those planes because they're not required to provide any reporting to the FAA. So you got to ask yourself, these, all these planes are built, and it's not like Alaska planes are built in a bundle and they all go out the door at the same time, right? I mean, you know, if you go in the factory, there's a Southwest plane, there's an American plane, there's a China Southern plane. Yeah. They're all mixed up, so you have a problem and it becomes you know, it, 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 it escalates. Yeah. I know this is not, I mean, I've, I, I know I can see in your face that um, it's, it's disconcerting, but you know, these are fixable problems. They're absolutely fixable yeah. if you admit them. And that's the problem, they're not admitting them. I believe that they're, to individual employees at the Boeing Company, that they live that. I mean, I believe most employees really do believe that and live that. You know, it, it's, it's really kind of disconcerting when you think that they make a big deal of the CEO coming and visiting the Renton factory, right? Like, he's coming down to talk to us about safety. He should be, that should be routine. It should be normal. He should be there all the time. He should go from, you know, all the factories and spend time with people on the floor. The fact they're making a big deal of it, I mean, that should be a pretty good warning flag that there's a problem there. The CEO is out of touch. He's completely, has no really understanding. I see emails, we get emails, we have a podcast, we get constantly uh, emails from employees that are frustrated. And again, I keep wanting to come back. Th there's, these problems can, are solvable, you know. Um, I'm not saying the max is solvable. I, I, I would probably not build that plane anymore if it was up to me. But these problems as a company are solvable. They're leadership issues and they gotta admit them. And again, you can't fix a problem if you don't admit it. And so all the talk, all the safety talk, and you know, you hear this comment all the time. Um, the airplanes have flown millions of miles safely, um, have had you know, dispatch reliability of 98%, all true. But those million of miles statistics, um, they mean nothing when it comes to uh, the, the individual quality of individual airplanes, right? There's no, it doesn't speak to the quality of individual planes. And it's never prevented a crash. And sadly, the two MAX planes that crashed had 100% dispatch reliability on the days that these planes crashed. So those statistics are old, worn out, and are not helpful at all to passengers. I'll just say, these are not just all mine, so these are ideas that are, other people fed me. And I just, I don't want to play, I will plagiarize them, but, um, you know, first and foremost, you have to admit that you are having these mistakes. And it's way bigger than this door issue. This is just a symptom of a large, much larger issue of quality control. Um, you have to admit that you have a problem. You have to recognize that everybody's a leader, not just the CEO, right? So that mechanic who's, who's a new mechanic who, Maybe he or she is, has got a problem and, and they need to speak up and they need to feel comfortable speaking up um, because what they're doing is really important. Um, having that uh, courage and fortitude to speak up, even when you know, there's a lot of pressure to get the job done, just get it done, move it down the line. Um, and the leadership at all levels need to support that environment. Training is huge. You know, I came out of the military and we would take, you know, young people and we'd put them in a, a, a three, six month training period and they would come out and they would go to their, in my case, they would go to a squadron and then they would, they would that was the beginning of their training, we would say. Yeah. You know, you're really now going to learn. And so we invested a lot in training of people. 
And right now, I think our typical employees will come in and they get like eight weeks of training and then they're put on the line. And, you know, if everything's going well and they're, um, they're rested and the quality control is good and they have their parts and they have the support of supervision and they're not pressured, they do amazing work. But you take a person and you put them in that pressure cooker and you say, Gwen, you got to get me your report. You got 30 minutes to get it done. Yeah. And I don't want to hear excuses, right? People stop talking. And we saw that. We saw that before the crashes. I saw that. That's what I testified to to Congress. So there are solutions, you know. And, but the biggest solution is I think the shareholders of the company need to demand new leadership. The CEO needs to go. He's had plenty of time, 10 plus years, lots of broken promises. Same thing with the board of directors. I hate to say it. Um, they need new leadership, and, and they need to start from scratch. I guess I would say that, um, you know, that's a great question, but I guess I would say that we should start with the people that lost their lives, right? 346 people died, um, preventable crashes. Did we learn our lessons? And I'd say we didn't. We're, we're very close to having another tragedy like that. So I would say, they need to stop, f do things right, better to get 10 planes out the door that are built perfectly than 30 that are built, eh, we think they're good, right? It's quality, you know, I, I use an example of, um, you go to a, I, I'm, a, I'm an old car buff, right? You go to an old car show and you see, you go to the old car and you see this car that's 100 years old and, and the condition is incredible, right? Like, you, like that's better than my new car. <laughs> and you're like, how do they do that? How do they maintain it? It's quality. It's workmanship. It's what Boeing Company has been known for. And so you, if you don't believe, and I'm, I'm a huge fan and supporter of the union because that's where the talent is. That's what, that's what the future of the company is, is bringing in new talent. I, I worked in high schools trying to help direct students to go work at Boeing. And... Um, I just feel like that if, if the leadership doesn't really value that expertise, that talent of those skilled workers, then they don't, they'll go elsewhere and that, that'll gut the company further. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues. It's not just this, uh, this one particular issue with the, with the door. This is a really hard, you know, really be honest look at the whole thing. And, you know, when the, when the CEO comes in and tells the employees, you know, you got to be safe and you need to be safe and you need to admit things, well, he really should start by looking in the mirror first.